My name is Louise O'Reilly. I am the Sinn Féin TD for the constituency of Dublin Fingal. You're very, very welcome to our podcast series. Um, we're discussing the need for a task force for Fingal and the need for a task force to tackle those issues on a multi-agency basis that people are facing in the constituency. So this evening we're going to be talking about childcare, about the challenges that parents face, about the challenges that childcare providers face and indeed about the challenges that the government face uh, in relation to policy. It's an extremely important issue for uh, the people here in, uh, in Fingal. We know that there is a huge demand. We have the youngest population in the state, the fastest population, the fastest growing population in the state. And, you know, we know that we need to provide for childcare because people have to go to work. It's good for kids to be in childcare, it's good for them to socialise, but we need to, to uh, concentrate on how we're going to improve supply and how we're going to improve conditions for the people who are working uh, in the early childhood sector, because that's also important. It's a really important job. Uh, they, you know, we, we entrust our kids um, to early childhood educators and indeed to, to, uh, to primary school teachers and SNAs, etc. So we really need, uh, I think, to reorient our focus on making it not just uh, high quality for the children, which of course it should be, but also high quality, decent pay and jobs, um, because that way we get, we'll keep people in the sector. So I'm joined by uh, Francis Byrne, who is the head of policy with Early Childhood Ireland. I'm also joined by Jean Faye Brady, who is the chair of Balbriggan Community Childcare Group, and by Kathleen Function, who is the Sinn Féin TD for Carlo Kilkenny, and also uh, our party spokesperson on children, youth affairs, and specifically on childcare. And can I just say, before I, uh, we get into it, uh, this is an all-woman panel, and it makes a very, very refreshing change. <laughs> so... You are all very, very welcome. Um, and I might kick off, uh, if, if that's okay, with yourself, Francis, uh, in terms of the, and I know that, that you live in the, the neighbouring constituency to ourselves here. So what would you see in terms of childcare provision as being the major challenges um, that, uh, that it's going to face? Let's, let's try and break it maybe into the, the short term because obviously we're emerging from COVID, that brings its own challenges. What have we learned? Uh, you know, how are we going to be able to improve it? And how can we ensure that we're going to be able to meet the, the childcare needs for the, for the future? I suppose the thing that, um, and hello, Louise, and thanks for having me on. Um, um, and hello, Kathleen and Jean. I think that the, um, the, main, the main thing, and everybody knows this, it's not uh, early childhood Ireland propaganda or anyone's personal opinion, is that, Ireland is the joint second lowest investor in um, early years um, and that comes from decades of uh, historical underinvestment um, and so we are constantly playing catch up. So even though the last government uh, when it was going out of power said it had increased spending by 117%, they absolutely did, but we really need a five to ten year plan with multiples of that kind of investment and until we get that we're going to be faced with the the horrible uh, three-pronged impact of um, our members uh, whether they're community or private the bulk of them facing sustainability issues constantly um, we're going to be facing into um, or continuing rather not facing into a uh, low pay for staff it's a very precarious sector for staff which is not good enough when you consider the importance of the role and the responsibility that staff have. As you said yourself, you know, parents entrust their children, their babies and children every day. Um, and then um, finally, of course, uh, Irish parents in Fingal and elsewhere across the country are paying the highest proportion of their take home pay regardless of whether they're low, medium or, or high income uh, people um, on childcare. So, um, that's that's really what's facing us and it has particular impacts um, on parents in areas like Fingal because of course uh, it is a young population 
lots of young uh, people, lots of young people who are becoming parents or planning to be parents or will be parents in the next five years. And in Fingal and other parts of Dublin, uh, you're waiting, you can be waiting on a place uh, in a creche, um, whether you are uh, have a fully subsidized place because you're unemployed or whether you are uh, working. Um, and even if in a couple, in a two parent family, both of you are working. And I suppose the final thing um, to say is that the other very uh, distressing thing is that unlike in other countries, Scandinavian countries where investment has been high, the other thing that isn't guaranteed is universal quality across the board for children, for babies and children. Um, and that's certainly what, what separates out Scandinavia. It doesn't matter whose child it is, they get the same quality and their parents have clarity about how much of a subsidy, subsidy they will pay and that's linked to their income and we don't have that here. Yeah, and if I could just maybe uh, bring Jean in here, and Jean, obviously, um, I'm familiar with your crash. Uh, yes. it's one of the it's one of the loveliest settings actually uh, for, uh, for for an early childhood setting but just in terms of the the challenges uh, that that you're facing not just covid related because that that's important but like covid will you know we'll eventually get past it and then we'll get back to well i suppose what's normal anyone says you know but when we do you know i mean would you have particular concerns for the area just in relation to being able to meet demand and keep up with the demands of, of, uh, of parents in the Fingal area? Yes, I would, Louise, because at the moment um, we do have waiting lists and we're the only community uh, crash here in Babrigan. They lost the one in Scarries and as far as I'm aware, there's only another one in Rush. So yeah, the demand is quite high here. and we, It's awful for us when parents are ringing us, you know, as we, we couldn't open today. But yeah, I'm man on the phone because we're getting so many inquiries and we, we, can't fit, we can't keep up with the demand here. Now, I have been in touch with Fingal County Council a while ago, well, a long time ago, looking if they could provide us with another building for another second community crash. But you know how difficult it is with Fingal County Council trying to tie them down and give us something. But yeah, we do have a wait list which is very sad when a parent badly needs a, a, a crash, but we can't give it to them, you know? Yeah. So it, and I think it's that, very that's, difficult. The, that's the challenge, isn't it? It's, it's, yes, it's making very, sure that there's enough supply there so parents can have the yeah. choice. But then and also it, it, ensuring that you know that that that, that you can you're not you're not, you're not oversupplied. So you, you want to be able yeah. to, to demand. And it, I, I can imagine to, it's tough to say no to parents. It's very very hard, and it's especially when you know it's parents that are doing their utmost maybe to get back to work, you know, and you can only afford, to, you know, with a community crash. And, you know, it's very, very difficult. And, you know, we feel awful. And all we can say to them, even today, all I could say to them was, I'll put you on my waiting list and I have to go back and look. You know, it's very, very difficult. I find there is, anyway. a, there is a clear demand for affordable childcare, and I think that the, yes. the big piece that's missing is you know a lot. Of, I, and I'm sure we've all had the same experience of talking to, and it is women in particular. Right? So it's, it's, we we know that oh, even yeah. when there's few parents in place, it is women in particular that you will hear, and they say, "I feel like I'm working all week just to I'm pay just for to... for the childcare that I need yeah. to enable me to work all week." It's it's very very tough, Kathleen. Just in terms of uh, from a policy perspective. And as the uh, as the, the the new government just formed, and you know, in terms of where they could be looking, do do you have any specific? I know Sinn Féin had a very ambitious uh, plan uh, in advance of the the last election in terms of our childcare proposals. But what would you see as being the top priorities for the the, the new incoming children's minister? Thanks, Louise. First of all, for the invitation. I think this is a great discussion. Um, I have loads of ideas. I'd love to have had the chance. To, to be in there as minister, if I can be so cheeky as to say that. But um, the, the main priorities really are uh, funding and sustainability. And then the, there's the issue around the workers and the cost for parents. So at the moment, we are seeing uh, places closing or at risk of closing because they did not get adequate funding during the whole COVID-19. So there's very serious sustainability issues. And what we've been calling for 
from day one of the virus was a sustainability fund to help services reopen. Now, I know they did announce some money and some reopening grants, but a lot of places will tell you that it didn't go far enough and information was vague. It was very last minute actually being delivered. Um, so there is issues. They need to ensure that they have enough funding there to keep places open. Part of that as well would be the current wage subsidy scheme. That needs to be continued for workers and it needs to be continued in particular for the early years childcare workers at the 100% rate so that they don't just get the 85%. Mm. That will help places around funding in the short term. But I suppose longer term, if we had the opportunity for our vision in Sinn Féin, it would be to move towards a publicly funded childcare where you're seeing more investment in the sector, which will also reduce fees for parents. Because the, the issues that you hear regularly from parents are, for a lot of women, it doesn't, sometimes it's not worth their while to actually go out to work. Yet they want to work, they want to build up a particular type of career, or maybe if they leave the workforce for a number of years, that can have an impact on their career. But yet childcare is so expensive, it can often people just feel like that they're working all week they're wrecked they're trying to juggle kids they're trying to juggle the job and you come home and you feel like you don't even have enough money to pay your bills so so um fees for parents is crucial but also the workers in the sector and actually getting a decent proper living wage and getting the recognition that they so badly deserve and i think only the one of the only positives coming out of the virus is that I suppose there has been a focus on the early years childcare sector and I'm hoping that that might help now give them not just the recognition they deserve, I'm not talking about a clap on the back, I'm talking about actual proper wages and I suppose some of the things that we have proposed in our election manifesto and had wanted to do if we'd had the opportunity to be in government is to introduce a living wage, a wage scale for workers starting at the living wage and also to, to increase the funding so that you could have services manage and let them reduce fees for parents because the vast majority of services would love to reduce the fees for parents and would love to pay their staff a decent living wage but unfortunately they're not getting the funding as Francis pointed out we're one of the lowest we're a joint second lowest for funding in the early year sector so of course their, their money is not going to be there to pay decent wages and to allow it to be affordable for parents and they're the the two of the key th things that we definitely would have wanted to achieve but I would think a lot of services at the moment are very concerned around sustainability and particularly when when there's talk of a possible second wave of the virus and you know if there was a second lockdown how would anyone survive they just wouldn't and that's the reality so that's why sustainability there really really needs to be a sustainability fund so that services can you know can can feel comfortable enough that they that they would be able to keep their doors open I tell you one of the things that's worrying me now, and and uh, and it, it might be that this is only just within my my own circle. A lot of people are going to be working from home. So when the uh, when we get back to normal, and the government are still saying, you know, work from home if you possibly can. And I think a lot of people. And I, by the way, I'm a big fan of working from home if you can do it. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, however. Uh, what I what I what worries me uh, is that women and it will be women. Look, it'll be some men, but it'll be mostly women. Will be working from home, but they'll be also trying to manage the the childcare requirements. And I just I just don't think that that's going to be good. You know that they'll they'll take the decision to work from home as much as they can, and then they'll balance the the affordability and the childcare. But it's doing two jobs. I mean, you know, the, and, and I don't think, you know, and, and Francis, you might have some thoughts on this. I don't think that's going to be sustainable, but I worry that that's going to be the stopgap for a lot of people and that it'll become more mainstream as, you know, according as we get, get, post, get into the post-COVID environment, we'll see more and more people working from home, but it will be driven as much by a childcare need as, a, as an actual work need. And I think you're going to have women doing two jobs at the one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the National Women's Council and others have have pointed to um, the impacts of COVID um, on working mothers in particular. Um, and um, I think we, th th those stories uh, remain to be fully told and fully heard. Um, the other reasons why that's not good is because, and, I'm, and again, not blaming women, I totally get it, trying to balance it all. Um, but the other reason it's not good, of course, is that, you know, and, and you started the conversation by saying this, um, the, the importance of, um, you know, centre-based care and experiences like that for young children. 
um, and that they have rights and, and certainly our colleagues in the Children's Rights Alliance and others, uh, academic experts have been saying the other voices that have been silent during this and, and there's been a huge impact on them are children. So children want to be back uh, in creches in, in Fingal and beyond and need to be. Um, and so there is a kind of a wider conversation that needs to be had about all of this. And of course, uh, and you said it yourself, that, that, those kinds of assumptions that we're inclined to make in Ireland about caring responsibilities exclude men. And many, many men would love to also feel that they have a choice. And if families could balance life better, I, I think we just have gotten it quite wrong in Ireland. We still don't have, uh, which is really shocking when you tell um, colleagues, not just from Scandinavia, but from other parts of the world about our maternity and paternity uh, leave allowances. Um, and how the pay is quite low if you're lucky enough to work for an employer who can top it up. But if you're not, um, there's been no commitment um, in Ireland to the, I mean, the, the European Commission has said it should be 66% of wages. Um, and there's been no commitment in Ireland to get there. We really should get there. Um, and then I suppose to speak for our age hotted Ireland members, while understandably there might be families who make that choice and we totally get the economic decision that people are making. If parents aren't going back, that will make the sector unsustainable as well. And will government step in? And if there's going to be a post COVID recession, and we all hope there won't be, like, you know, will there, ne will there nearly be a horrible inevitability about women feeling under pressure or some of them maybe making a choice or some of them feeling they've no choice combined with, well, we're low on public, we don't really want to invest in public expenditure at the moment, we're in the throes of a recession, and might we, might we be right back to square one um, the way we were 10, 15 years ago uh, in the sector? And none of that would be good for the future um, because it means, because what, what we all want is uh, a fully subsidised or getting there system. That's the direction we all want to go in. Um, and we don't want to step back from that because that's the system that will offer the best outcomes for children and real choice for parents as opposed to trying to balance the books. So, yeah, I agree. It's a major concern. It's huge. And uh, Jean, if I could just maybe bring you in on yeah. that, you know, in terms of childhood development, like actually being in a, a mixed setting rather than just being at home. I mean, like we all have spent the time with our kids. I, I don't don't take me up wrong on this now. Of course we do. But it's really good for a child's development, actually, to be in a, a, that kind of group environment. Yeah, it is. I mean, they need to mix. They need to be with other children. They need to be with even their own age group and see how they behave and play. And it's brilliant. And I mean, I never had the opportunity when my children were growing up to put them in a crash because it wasn't there at that particular time because I worked all the time. And, but I was lucky enough to have family. But yeah, I think they're better in a crash because they mix, they play, they learn how to behave. And then you can see if they have developing problems mm. you know and yeah that's difficult to call a parent in and explain to them that Mary or Johnny has you know something wrong but yeah I think they're better they're mixing they're playing and they're having fun and that's what it's all about yeah exactly and, 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 and you know the, the the fear would be that that would be lost you know if yeah they're forced into a situation where they can't you know they I can't mean, do I, it because it's not just for work, it's actually for, it's for their your own mental health as well. Yeah. <laughs> let's and be for, honest. For the parents' mental health. Yes, yeah, that, let's be I, very honest, Jean, we yeah, know. <laughs> I'm very honest because I used to run out and say, bye kids, I love yous. Mammy has to work, but mammy needs her adult time. And I used to, and I'm being honest there, I used to say to my kids, oh, I hate going to work. But Jean didn't. I ran out that door and I was gone. Yeah, I was in a job that I was able to do job sharing, you know, walk around my kids at the time. But yeah, I didn't have the luxury because there wasn't many crashes at that particular time. Well, my yeah. kids were gone. And that's so, the I, I'm, I'm second, what am I, second generation working, yeah. working mom. So when, when I, my daughter was born, my mum was in work, so it wasn't an option. My, my mother was yeah. like, I'd love to help you, but I have a full-time job going on here as well, Louise. So, so you can't, so, yeah. Yeah. And you it know, is important. Was, it's important for parents, but it's also very important uh, for kids that they can do that that kind of socialising. And I know, Kathleen, you're a working mum. I'm lucky I'm, I'm out the other end of it, but you're a working mum with a fairly demanding job. Like, you know, the, the issues around childcare are so important. They're so intrinsic for, for working parents. 
but they actually are really important for uh, childhood development as well. No, they definitely are. And it's funny because I had a, a child trying to interrupt me there just as we're, <laughs> we're speaking. And even though they're, they're nine and 13, um, they're, as my mother always says to me, they're still your children. You still be worried about them when they're in their 20s as well. So um, it is really important. And just the, the point that Jean made as well regarding um, if there is any potential additional needs or any difficulties that a child might be experiencing, like early intervention is key with all of that. And it's great to have um, even the two years now of the ECC scheme, some people call it the free preschool scheme, but I know that um, it's not necessarily totally free, so a lot of people don't like to refer to it as that, but that is really crucial as well um, for children. The fact that they get two years over the one year in the past, and even, even before that, it, it wasn't in existence, but it is, it's great for them. And I also think the virus has been really hard on kids, and they're constantly, find yourself saying oh in a minute or you know i've to finish this or this call is coming in so for children who've been in that situation for the past number of weeks it's great for them to get back into their own space and their time with their friends and their own routine and all the different things like that and it is it is crucial to children so i think um you know it's it's vital like especially when you see your children saying to you that they miss school you do realize um how important it is just even for the socialization part yeah, but also, I mean, you know, it, it's it's one of those things. And um, when my daughter was was young, and that's about twenty, she she'll be twenty five in a, in a couple of weeks' time. And you know, people used to say to me, "Oh, isn't it desperate that you have to put her into a crash?" And I remember thinking that she was in a crash because I was I was working and and my husband was working. But like, actually, if I hadn't been working, I think it would have been a good thing for her to be in a crash. I think it would have been yeah. a very good thing for her for her own development, you know, as well as uh, as well as anything else. And and I think that maybe that sometimes gets lost in the debate the, the 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 voice of the child and the needs of the child so like before covid we had a huge big conversation around insurance and insurance for childcare and and you know and it was it was very much policy focused and and it was all you know it was all about finances and you know and i kind of felt in that and it was an important conversation but the voice of the child sometimes gets lost you know that you don't you don't kind of hear about the, the child's needs and I think and I don't know if there is a way that we can incorporate that into into government policy and I suppose that's you know Francis maybe you you might have some thoughts on that because I think that has to be central to it as well yes it's important for parents but it's also important for kids it's also important that we hear from them you know and I don't think we do sometimes we we, we miss that you know Mm. Well, it's certainly something um, that Early Childhood Ireland would be saying to the new minister that it's really important um, to hear that voice. There's all kinds of creative ways you can consult um, younger children. It, it has happened before and actually um, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs has done it before. Um, it's really important. The government is also uh, um, talking about setting up a child care agency, um, Child Care Ireland, I think it's going to be called. And um, um, I think that agency could play a could play a role um, in in hearing all of the voices, and of course, um, it's important to to mention. Um, and we certainly have some uh, child minders among our membership. But child minding is also important. Um, the the last government had made efforts to to look at that area. They did a they did a report. Um, at, but but child minding is part of the picture. I think sometimes people think. Oh, in Scandinavia, it's all centre, but it's, you know, really good um, parental leave, which they have. And then it's all centre based. But actually, in two of the Nordic countries, childminders are within the net as well and are um, uh, considered professionals, are qualified. Um, now, we're certainly not looking for anything like the regulations that um, Jean and others have to have to put up with, I suppose. Um, and some of them are absolutely understandable and fair and everything else. Nobody is looking for that in relation to child minders. It's a completely different environment, but it is important that they're given recognition. Um, again, it goes back to both parental choice and there's parts of the country, including Fingal, where there is no choice because as we've heard from Jean, um, community and private uh, settings can have waiting lists, but also for some children, it's a better option, particularly when they're younger or a mix if we could you know for some children if they were doing their etchy hours in the morning and then a childminder in the afternoon or whatever that might work for them so it's important if we really are listening to children and looking at what's best for the individual child that childminders are brought into the conversation as well yeah no i couldn't agree more and i think the 
you touched on a very important issue there and it's one of choice it's one of ensuring that you know that parents have options that they have choices and that you know and that that they can choose not just what works for their lifestyle what works for their child you know because not every child is going to thrive in every setting and you know that you have that and i think that one of the things and this is why we've been proposing the the task force for fingal because what we want to see is uh, is a multi-agency approach focusing on the needs of this growing constituency because our needs are different to uh, to, to to other areas you know because of the the age and the profile of the population and i think for us you know what we want to see is parents being able to have that choice so that they can choose not just you, you know you, you pick one mode and you stay with it and that's it but as you say that you have the option of maybe mixing your ECCE with your uh, with a child minder that you can you know can have your child in in the different environments and one you know that like it, it does have to be adaptable it does have to be able to work for you to be able to fit in with your work and with your social life and 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 with everything else but something that is really responsive to to a child's needs and I think you know, I mean, Jean, you touched on it there in relation to the waiting lists. If there's yeah. waiting lists, we know that means parents don't have a choice. That means that the, you know, if you're on a couple of waiting lists, your only choice is to wait till you get the phone call and then you take whatever, whatever option happens to be available. Yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah. I think, you know, I mean, do you hear that from your own parents that they, you know, that what they want to see is, is more choice and more, uh, you know, that they, they want to be able to uh, maybe do, do a little bit of mix and match as well? Yeah, well, they, they really need places, and, and you know, and that's the problem. And like, even today, as I said, I'm only in here manning the phone, and they actually were looking for um, she actually two children, but I couldn't give her a guarantee that I have a place because I told her I have to go and look at the list and, and look at things, and I still can't guarantee, I couldn't guarantee that. I'd love and be able to say to her, Yeah, I can take your two children, brilliant, but I can't. And again, I have to go, uh, unfortunately, all the staff are on annual leave this week. So I have to go through all the lists and double check and, and you know, and travel check that I'm not going to give a place that I read being assigned to somebody else. But it's very, very difficult. And what I find as well, I know I was talking earlier on about the children. I think it's very important for if we've only got one child. I think it's very important that, uh, you know, only one child in the family is in a crash. So they learn how to mix and play and they thrive through this. Because it's very hard when there's only one child in the family and they've no other children to mix with. And COVID was very hard for those children. It was very hard for all children. I think for a child that's on its own, only one, you know, I think that was very difficult for them. And I'd like to appall all the children I think were fantastic. I think the younger children were fantastic through this. I have two, go, I have two grandchildren who live with me. And they were absolutely brilliant through this. They understood. Mm -hmm. And I, any children I met outside, I think they were brilliant. No, they were, they were at a hundred percent. I think they, 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 uh, cause I, and I think as well, you know, we need to maybe look at the, the long-term impacts cause I think there will be, uh, mm -hmm. issues around, you know, cause I think some kids came through it very well. Some kids are now going to be very fearful. They're going to be worried, uh, yeah. you know, like same with all kids, they go through phases, you know, but I think what, if, if we learned anything, I think we, we learned a couple of things. One, I, and I think this is an, a very, <laughs> this is not necessarily a good thing. We learned that it's possible to work from home and manage your childcare responsibilities. Now, I don't think that that's, that's a good lesson for us to have learned because I fear that the, the lesson from that would be, oh, well, if you don't have childcare, but sure, can you not work from home and can you not juggle it that way? I think we need to, we need to focus on how, and just, you know, in, in terms of how we can improve the availability of childcare here in Fingal and, uh, you know, ensuring that parents have that choice. I mean, have we seen anything as yet that would give us, you know, comfort that there's going to be a long-term plan and that the plan matches up with the needs of uh, with the needs of the population because I mean we need we need school places and we need yes, childcare and we need it now you know I mean we you know we don't we can't wait for that here we have uh, there's waiting lists I mean I, I have it every day of the week parents contacting me because they either have an unsustainable commute so you might have you know your mom lives in uh, your mom your mom lives in Fairview but if you work in Blanchardstown and you live in Swords that was a woman I spoke to no childcare so she drives to Fairview in the morning and then swings back to her job in Blanchardstown when I mean that's that's no life so, I mean and like the, the like of community childcare 
good value for money, good for parents, based in the community, responsive to parents' needs, and 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 we don't see the the plan coming through for you know for ensuring that that is available when parents need it, and uh, and that they have that that choice. And I think. And Kathleen has said this often, um, and, and I know Francis Jonas have said as well, if we had the same focus and the same attitude to childcare up to the age of four as we do to school from the age of four, you, you, you have to have it. It has to be good quality. You know, it's there, it's provided, it's a given, the assumption is that you go. Then we wouldn't have to have those conversations of how many hours do you need and do you need it, do you not need it, that it's actually, yeah. we know that it's, a, that it's a good thing. I mean, how far away do you think are we, Francis, from, uh, from that kind of conversation? Um, not to depress everybody, but I think we are. I think we are a bit far away. On the other hand, mm. we really shouldn't be. It's very frustrating. We know we have a really good central statistics office. They count the number of births every year. We know where those children are. Like we've enough data. Mm. Um, we know the housing estates we built during the boom. We know hopefully there'll be more housing. Who who knows? But God, you'd hope so. Mm. Um, and so there there should be. Now look, the the city and county childcare committees. You know, I think that, you know, one of the things that Early Childhood Ireland will be saying to a new minister and to whatever this childcare agency um, uh, ends up being that, you know, the whole area of planning and a role for um, the, those committees, uh, you know, beefing up their role is really important. Um, and, you know, that it's not so, it's, it actually doesn't cost money to plan well. <laughs> and probably you save money if you plan well. Um, and certainly what you I mean what you're describing there I was just shaking my head about the idea of getting up in the morning for everybody for everyone in that car and, I, and I'm assuming they're in a car um, going over to Fairview and then that poor parent going over to Blanchardstown um, every day like that's no life uh, for anybody um, we all know the M50 I mean that's one of the upsides of the of Covid it hasn't been but it'll be a car park again I've no doubt soon enough like that's just dreadful and it's completely and utterly preventable yeah. and that's I think the the key and I mean Jean I know you probably see it with the parents coming in exhausted uh you know and and the like nobody wants to be spending all of their life commuting and nobody wants to be spending all of their life you know working just to pay for childcare but I suppose just to be upbeat about it you know I mean as Francis says it's not impossible to plan. It makes sense. It makes financial sense. It makes sense for kids. It makes sense for families. We know because of the CSO data. And you look, at, even if we didn't have the CSO, I mean, you know, you look at where there are uh, housing developments. You see young couples moving in, and sure, as night follows day, <laughs> children are going to are going to follow. So it's it's not. You don't need to be. Uh, you know, you don't need to have a crystal ball to know that. You know, when you build houses. Families will move in, children will be born, and those children will need will need childcare. And I just think sometimes we lag behind. And Kathleen, maybe uh, you have a, a view on this, just in terms of how we can be a little bit more proactive in terms of planning. Yeah, thanks, Louise. I think I suppose the the big problem to date is really that there has been a lack of political will. So I think a lot of the purpose-built childcare facilities that we do have were at the time that there was European grants available. Um, and I haven't seen one of those built. I was actually trying to remember recently, I think 2008 was possibly the last one here down in the Carlo Kilkenny constituency that I can remember. I'm open to correction on that, but I mean, that's 12 years ago, if that is the case. So we do need to see um, a lot more political will and political focus on it because it's not that it can't be solved. There is so many countries in the world that have excellent early years facilities and they have a system that works for parents, that works for the workers and that most importantly works for the children. So what we need to do really is just be a lot more focused on it and actually have have it as a political priority and I, I do think that you know to date it really hasn't been and even the fact that there was talk of the this government getting rid of the Department of Children and possibly getting rid of a standalone minister. Now I know thankfully that didn't happen but there is a lot now in that new department and you know it really needs to be to be given the focus in terms of the investment and in terms of the planning and you know it's not it's not rocket science you know they, they, they need to actually put the money into it um, because you're not going to see as many places maybe opening up like a number of years ago, I think people like as individuals kind of maybe started from their home and it grew from there. 
first of all, insurance won't allow that really anymore. That type of day is gone as such. And, um, and I don't think you'll see people have the confidence in the sector. They'll be afraid they'll end up with a lot of debt because all they can see is horror stories of places maybe having to close or having to let go staff or constantly be bogged down with paperwork. And, you know, so they need to put a system in place where the proper funding is going to be there and where I suppose Francis touched slightly on this, but the one agency where there is only one agency that people are dealing with, not three and four different inspectors. Nobody minds inspections, nobody minds all of the regulations because you have to have regulations, but just let's have it streamlined. And, and there's a way of doing that. So you're not dealing with Tusla, Cobble, Department of Education and everybody at the same time. So it just, to me, it, it needs a lot more political will and focus. And I think if that was there along with the money, a huge amount um, could be done. And I really hope that this new minister is going to, to listen and listen to all of the very good groups out there that know exactly what they're talking about, that are experts on this for the last number of years, and that can certainly give lots of guidance. So he's not going to be wanting for, for suggestions and solutions. It's just- No, he won't. <laughs> Hopefully they'll be implemented. <laughs> that's the thing. And you see, that's what I'd love to see. Um, you know, Jane, myself and yourself walking around yeah. in North County, Dublin, picking out the areas where the, the childcare facilities need to be built. You know, I mean, Absolutely. that's like, if yeah. we saw that, you know, like uh, it, how many how many additional crashes do we need in, in North County, Dublin? You know, we need to be doing that analysis, not just for 10 years time, but now when the kids yeah, want to I mean, here when they yeah. need them, you know. Yeah, I thought actually that when you were building, now I correct me if I'm wrong on this, I thought when you were building new houses, you're supposed to do a facility for crashes. Now, maybe I'm wrong, because I've been watching Taylor's Hill, where I can't see anything that yeah. they're going to do one. Or I yeah, and that's the, yeah, no, that's, that, that's the thing. It's, the, it's not integral to the planning process, and it should be. So very often it gets yeah. promised as part of a development, but then when the development goes up, you see everything else gets built and then it's a case of oh well we'll, we'll build that after and parents are, are absolutely desperate and then that brings you back to the waiting lists and i suppose yeah. you know in terms of community childcare and indeed uh, facilitating uh, the, the the private sector as providers what you really need is the county council working hand in glove with the child care agency so that you can have that uh, so that you, you can have that kind of partnership where you're planning so you look at the data from the cso you see there's the age profile as sure as night follows day we know yeah. we know what's going to happen next so let's plan for it let's look at you know the the, the age profile and the demographics and i think that here in fingal we've had uh, you know we've had we've had an issue because of a failure to plan so we've had a failure to plan for uh, for the housing that we need, and then housing built but without the infrastructure. So it's 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 just a question of joining up the the dots and making sure that yeah. we have that kind of um, that we have that cohesion and that sort of dedicated focus. And I think that if there was one positive thing I would take out of of COVID, and 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 Julie's might have a view as well, it's that people now have realised the value of childcare. Yeah. That it's not, uh, you know, that it's not simply the when you see the kids, and I, I saw it with my own uh, grandson, how much he missed the crash. Crash, yeah. He missed his friends, how much he couldn't, you know, he couldn't understand that they that that he couldn't see them every day, and I, you know, I mean, if we if we take anything out of that, it's actually the value of childcare and you know the important role that it has to play just in our everyday lives and how important it is. And I, I sincerely hope that those lessons have been learned, but I know from uh, certainly uh, from, from Jean and Francis, we won't be found wanting in terms of lobbying and making proposals yeah. and, and you know, that's the thing. So I suppose the, the challenge now for us and particularly here in, in Fingal with our demographics and our population is actually to make sure that we keep the political pressure on and that we ensure that we have a childcare service that will deliver for for children, for parents, and and be at the heart of communities, which is where we we really need it to be. So I suppose, Francis, for, to yourself, um, we're going to be finishing up shortly. But just uh, if I if I give you maybe the, uh, the the opportunity to sum up, if you would. Yeah, uh, no problem. I mean, I would go back to one of the things um, um, that Kathleen said, um, you know, uh, about the wage subsidy scheme. So we've, our organisation has been told for years, SIP2 has been told, the Women's Council has been told, children's organisations have been told, 
um, oh no, we can't, uh, we can't have a pot of money for wages. It's largely a privatized sector, which of course it is at the moment. But, you know, oh, okay, I'm not going to say overnight because um, early childhood Ireland members in Fingal and beyond would kill me. But even though it took three weeks to actually come in, it was announced overnight. There was a cabinet meeting. The outgoing minister went, she got agreement and it was implemented. And in relation to the partial reopening, the summer reopening, it is part of that. Um, it, 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 it isn't enough and it probably is going to be shown, shown that it's not enough. But the principle that there'd be a pot of money paid by the state with staff stamped on it is absolutely something that Early Childhood Ireland is determined to hang on to. And from a practical point of view, it's going to be needed again for the full reopening in September. There's no question about that. Um, so from our point of view, that gives us a big opportunity to hold on to that and to put that into our own budget uh, 2021. Can't believe I'm saying that, but anyway, 2021 um, lobbying of the current government, coming to talk to yourselves and other parties about, look, this is really important um, and to try, you know, and hang on to it. And also it would be a good benchmark going forward for how we would measure investment, that if we had the operational grants that Jean and others need, particularly in disadvantaged areas, um, in areas, in, in creches that serve those areas, if we had the capital funding for everybody and if we had the staff funding. So if those three pieces of the pie could be held onto, it'd be, it, it could be a game changer. Um, so we certainly uh, will be trying to encourage government um, uh, and other political parties to support that. I think Kathleen was absolutely right. It's a major uh, piece, of the, piece of the pie going forward. It is, and, and Jean, if I could just come to yourself on this, you know, yeah. in terms of being able to plan, having the, knowing that there was going to be that investment there, that you had the money for the wages and that you, you know, you could, you'd actually be in a position to, well, maybe they could streamline the forms a little bit because I know, I know it's like, you know, <laughs> which is actually be in a position to plan out for the childcare needs for the, for the region. If you, you know, if you weren't constantly juggling the money and juggling the forms that you'd actually yeah. have an opportunity to, to, to sit back and say, right, what, how can we make this the best it can be? How can we put yeah. that? Well, you know, it would be great because then I would be able to do um, a wage. Uh, to, I could say to the girls, like, every year, hopefully we can give you a raise. You know, we were very lucky last year. It wasn't very much, but we were able to give our staff a small little rise, which I was delighted to be able to come in and tell them that. But now we're all the problems I'm having. That's not going to happen this year. But yeah, it would be brilliant to have that. Absolutely. And I think a lot of crashes would sit back and go, wow. Yeah. You know, because all through the summer it was great. I'd be in here doing the wages, getting the money in, checking I got from revenue. Then I'd get this from public. Yeah, I have to do all this. And now I have to put that on spreadsheets and have that. I have to have all that in by the 4th of July. But you know what? If we could keep that it would be brilliant for each crash. That's yeah. what I'd love. Because the reopening funding, the grants, it's not enough what we have to do. It really isn't. Yes, I'll be applying for it. I'm glad. But it's not enough for what we have to do. Yeah. And you I know, think we, so. we can do better than, uh, well, it's, it's not enough, but it's better than nothing. I think we no, can... No, it's better you know, than nothing. That's course. it. I, mean, I think we, we could do better than that. We yeah, of course we can. Better than that. And Kathleen, just to yourself, finally... Yeah, no, I think the two ladies have hit the nail on the head there. The wage subsidy scheme being continued at a full 100% is crucial because I also think for places, particularly, I suppose, I'm thinking of rural areas where you might not need all your staff back straight away, mm -hmm. how do you even pick? Like, it's an unfair situation to ask anyone. Um, and so, I mean, that, that would definitely be one thing. And then we just need the adequate funding. We need the funding that's there for exactly what you were saying so people wouldn't have to be worried about farms and are they going to be able to open are they going to get this in on time that they just actually be able to relax and focus on the children and the staff and that's exactly what it should be about so all we're looking for is the adequate funding that you know we've been crying out for for years that so many other countries have that it would be a huge benefit to all of our children um, and that you can see the benefits of the children that have gone i always say this my own children one had one year 
of the ECCE and the youngest fella had the two years and the, the difference in their school readiness. And for me, that, that sums it up. You know, I mean, we want to be focused on children and what's right and what's good for them. Then they need to take it seriously. They need to give it the money it deserves and the wages and particularly in the aftermath of COVID to continue with the wage subsidy scheme and to continue um, and increase, and that is the crucial part of it, increase funding um, because there, there is, it's not, as Jean said, it doesn't go far enough. So people need whatever they need to keep going because at the end of the day, if the early years can't survive, well then no, no other sector is going to survive because no one will be able to go to work. Yeah, that, I think that, that you put it very well as for the, for the final word there, Kathleen. So um, I suppose just to, to, by way of briefly summing up, you know, uh, what we're doing with this series of podcasts is we're examining the challenges faced by people who are living in Fingal and why we believe that we need a task force type approach. So it's not good enough to crack the nut of childcare without proper sustainable housing development. Likewise, you've got your amenities and your facilities, your infrastructure, your transport and all that goes along with that. But I think the cornerstone of, uh, of our plan for Fingal, for a fairer Fingal and for a Fingal, uh, you know, where it is a good place uh, to raise a child and where it is a, a good place to live, um, you know, fantastic people here, but I think we are, we are lacking. So one of the things that we will be doing uh, as part of our task for, as part of our task force initiative is trying to knit up all of the elements that need to be there and you know not that I wasn't convinced before but after talking uh, to my guests now I'm absolutely convinced that the cornerstone of any task force has to be childcare and has to be provision that is child-centered that is parent friendly and that is affordable and uh, can be delivered because we know we have the expertise uh, we have the people to plan we just need the the political will to be able to drive it forward so i would like to thank my guests thank you to francis byrne thank you to jean fay brady and thank you to kathleen function that's all from us thank you very much for listening <laughs>